It is an extremely rare person who has not had to confront bullies in one form or another. If we can look beyond the terror they reign upon us, we can analyze them objectively. And we can recognize that not only are they insecure, but that they are also cowardly. And they are masters of projection, often claiming they are victims of those they brutalize. Case in point, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. This new Vlad the Impaler, and no offense intended to our much appreciated NATO partner Romania, might have made the old Transylvanian leader cringe. While there is absolutely nothing humorous about this political vampire, ridicule is a useful weapon because he reflects an attitude of the old Soviet Union. He is desperately preoccupied with not being challenged, much less being ridiculed or, heaven forbid, humiliated. Most Americans, including myself, once knew far less about Ukraine than we do about, well, just about everything else. Ukraine's complicated history includes the legacies of Vikings, Sarmatians, Polovsi and Kumans, erstwhile allies and or adversaries of Mongols slash Tartars, Poles, Russians, Turks, Austro-Hungarians, Nazis, and Stalinists. There is even evidence suggesting that the legend of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table were in fact the Christian Roman commander Artorius Castus and the Sarmatian warriors who helped defeat the Saxon invaders at the Battle of Baden Hill circa 500 AD. To be sure, the Sarmatians are part of the Rus ancestry and their bravery is being displayed daily as they fight a potentially self-defeating neo-Stalinist dictator. So a common and yet informed knowledge of my mother's Carpathian birthplace is nigh well impossible. The complications are illustrated by my own family's history. In 1887, my grandfather, Mikhail Ivanovich Sass, was born in Bitla, an East Carpathian community fairly close to the protrusion that now constitutes Poland's southeastern border. He was identified with his own father's Prussian ancestry, having elements of Polish-Russian culture, but of German nationality. To confuse matters, however, Prussia rhymes with something else, so on his naturalization certificate, his former nationality is identified as Russian although another empire was in control. When my grandmother, Anastasia Yadrovna Mihalko, was born in the same town five years later, there was no longer any question that the Habsburgs were in charge, and whenever asked, she identified her former nationality as Austrian. Never mind that her own U.S. naturalization document claims that she came from Poland. World War I changed the political arrangement. When my mother, Yekaterina Mikhailovna Sass, was born in the very same place in 1922, post-war designations meant that Polish was, accurately at the time, listed as her former nationality on her own American citizenship papers. By the way, she came to the U.S. when she was 10 months old, and she grew up thoroughly American. Notwithstanding my dad's Scotch-Irish and Pennsylvania-Dutch ancestry, I was raised Russian Orthodox, and my mother insisted I study Russian since it was perceived as being more useful than Ukrainian, especially during the Cold War. That gives you some idea 
of Ukraine's complex history, and that is only since the late 19th century. Let me point out here that a Russian word for weak or puny is slabi, which if one places the accent on the first syllable, slabi, suggests a justifiable impression of bad blood. Despite his shows of force and his efforts to demonstrate his personal machismo, the whole world now recognizes that he is the stereotypical bully, cowardice and projections as a victim included. He exhibits what can be best described as his precarious grasp of the truth every time he opens his mouth, and never more so when he tries to argue. That the national culture, which gave his own country its two most outstanding sources of identity, has never existed, or that somehow belongs to Russia. But let's take a look at the facts. First of all, Russia should thank Ukrainians for its name. Perhaps my call in Ukraine's history complex is a quintessential sample of understatement. It certainly involves a number of guest star invaders. Even her ninth-century leaders, Rurik and Oleg, were of Varangian or Viking stock, which may help explain why so many of us have blonde hair and/or light blue or green eyes. But more than that, the Vikings provided an Old Norse word, "kathar," or oarsman. Which the Greeks transformed into Ross, and which in time became Rus. And that is not the only name by which our ancestral Ukrainians knew themselves, but also the name that they would provide their less sophisticated neighbors in the East in years to come. Establishing nominative identity is a great place to start, but beyond that. A far greater bequest is the foundation of a people's culture, and that is without question the second great gift that the Rus tendered what became Russia. In the waning years of the 10th century, 988 to be precise, a noble ancestor of Rurik and Oleg would doubtlessly have been seen as Viking. But at this very time, a successor, Prince Volodymyr the Great of Kiev, provided first the Rus and later the Russians what is arguably both the cradle and the treasure chest of culture itself: a national religion. Volodymyr went to very great lengths in examining the world's religions, including. The capital of the old Byzantine Empire. He was told by his emissaries to Constantinople that when they attended a divine liturgy at the Hagia Sophia Greek Orthodox Cathedral, they felt as though they had been transported to heaven itself. The prince soon made his choice for the spiritual identity of the Rus. Of course, there were other, more practical reasons for his decision, and the Byzantine Emperor Romanos II's daughter Anna became Volodymyr's queen under military threat. But she came to cherish her imposed position as a holy mission, and her new subjects came to cherish her. In any case. First, by receiving the sacrament of baptism himself, and then by decreeing that his people be baptized in the Dnieper River, the Prince of Kiev established the Greek, in time to be known as the Russian Orthodox Church, in this range of Eastern Europe. Putin's irredeemably atrocious invasion of my mother's birth turf. Has struck me on a personal level in two different ways. Of course, my once half-hearted efforts to reconnect 
with my family in Ukraine now has new and powerful urgency. But it also underscores something I recognize mentally, but now appreciate on a much deeper level. I always knew that my maternal grandmother, Anastasia, whose name remarkably means resurrection, was strong and courageous. But with the passage of time, I realized the depth of her strength and fortitude. Until I became a father who nearly lost a child, and later a widower, I had no idea what it takes to deal with the death of one's spouse and children, especially when three of these four demises occur within five years. I still cannot fathom the loss of a spouse and three children. But now that I see the prowess and irrepressible resiliency of the Rus, also known as the Ruthines, in the face of mindless slaughter, I can better appreciate what an extraordinarily powerful person my Ukrainian grandmother was. So when Bad Vlad mumbles his canards about who owes what to whom, and who shall overcome whom to the delight of whomever else, he does little beside underscore the abysmal depth of his own deceptions. This includes his self-deception that anyone outside the neo-Stalinist dystopia he is trying to cobble by shoveling sand against the tide is in any way deceived.